your body does some wild things after a longer term fast. 36 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. It's a whole different ball game from a shorter term fast. And it's an entirely different universe from your standard eating. So how do you break a long term fast properly? Well, there's a lot of things we have to cover. I'm going to try to condense it because I want you to just be able to have a simple package that you can take and run away with so that you can make sure you exit your fast safely and effectively so that you can get the best results. Hey, before we dive into all the science here, can you please hit that red subscribe button? I think you'll really like what we have on this channel. That way you'll always see our daily videos. And then you hit that little bell icon that's there and that's going to allow you to turn on notifications so you get a little ding on your phone every time I do post a daily educational video. All right, let's dive in. So refeeding after a fast is one of the most important things. In my opinion, it's almost more important than the fast itself, okay? But you have to remember during a longer fast, your body goes into these different, I don't know, kind of safety processes. Now, one of the things I wanna focus on the most is electrolytes. And this isn't some basic thing, me telling you to consume electrolytes during a fast. No, this is actually the opposite. I want you to avoid having salt and avoid having specific electrolytes after your fast. So hear me out. What ends up happening is your body does a good job of stabilizing serum electrolyte levels. What that means is when you fast, you're not, you're not taking in food. So your body does a good job of realizing, uh-oh, we don't have electrolytes coming in. So it sucks electrolytes out of your cells and puts them into the bloodstream. That's a good way for your body to maintain serum electrolyte homeostasis, keeps it in balance. Well, then what happens is after we break our fast, we suddenly have a spike in insulin because we consumed food. Well, what happens then? Well, because insulin allows the cell to open up, what happens is because of what is called the law of osmolarity, all the electrolytes that are now in the bloodstream flood into a cell that is depleted of electrolytes. It's a natural law. It's called the law of osmolarity. When you have a cell that doesn't have a lot of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, stuff like that in it, but you have a lot in the bloodstream, the moment that GLUT4 transporter comes to the edge of the cell, all those electrolytes are gonna flood into that cell, which sounds like kind of a cool thing, except it can damage a cellular membrane because it happens so fast. So what you wanna do is you wanna be very conscious of this by not consuming carbohydrates after you break a long-term fast. And I do not care if you are keto, carnivore, whatever, if you wanna have carbs, just don't, because right after you break your fast, you need to keep those insulin levels low or you can throw yourself off this whole electrolyte imbalance. And this has been talked about in research journals as refeeding syndrome. It's a legit thing. Okay, so we have to be careful. So step one, do not consume carbohydrates right after you break a long-term fast. Lean protein is where it's at. But secondly, you're better off to not add salt after your fast. Okay, it's a better option to consume a little bit of salt water throughout the course of your long-term fast than it is to load up on it afterwards. Do not go and have some deli meat that's got 400 milligrams of sodium in a two ounce serving because you're only adding fuel to that fire that can disrupt that metabolic or that uh, membrane, okay, that cellular membrane. This may not seem like an issue, but at a cellular level, it's causing damage and can cause some issues later on down the line, okay? So we just don't want to deal with that. Another thing is very important to have small portions. Very important to have small portions so that A, you're not having big insulin spikes, but B, you're also able to digest it, but you're also not gonna just take in just random amounts of sodium that are in some foods. For example, if you were to have eggs, eggs have a good amount of sodium. So don't go having six eggs. Anyhow, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Now let's jump over to something else that is randomly esoteric, but exceptionally important, and that is thiamine. Okay, thiamine is required for a lot of enzymatic processes, specifically when it comes down to glucose and fat metabolism. Okay, so after a fast, you're already a little bit depleted in thiamine. But then if you have a bunch of carbohydrates, your body has to exhaust its resources of thiamine in order to metabolize the glucose. So let me back up for a second to make some sense of this. When you metabolize carbohydrates, you require thiamine. Okay, if you have too many carbohydrates coming in right after a fast, all of the thiamine that's in your body, relatively speaking, gets zapped in order to break down and help process that glucose, which leads to a thiamine deficiency in the short term, what's called acute thiamine deficiency. This acute thiamine deficiency can result in a lot of different issues, a myriad of problems, mainly that you don't have enough thiamine for glycolytic enzymes. What does that mean in layman's terms? 
it means all of your thymine has been used up to process the glucose that you just consumed. So you don't have enough left to store it, to store the carbohydrates properly. So you end up going through what's called anaerobic glucose metabolism. Again, complicated, but it's a process that could alter your body's blood pH, leading to a bunch of other issues. If you've ever done a longer term fast and broken it kind of randomly because you just didn't have instruction, and you notice that hours later you just feel foggy, you don't feel weird, well, I have experienced that too, and generally speaking, I could say that, well, at least I think, that is what a thiamine deficiency feels like. Your body's all out of whack, you're going through anaerobic metabolism of the glucose rather than storing it as glycogen, and you run yourself into an issue. So what foods do you consume that are high in thiamine? Well, you could take a shortcut and take a thiamine supplement, but I think it's always best to do it with whole foods whenever possible. So lean salmon, because I don't want you breaking a fast with a high amount of fat, so like a lean sockeye salmon, Lean chicken, lean turkey, or lean pork is actually really good because pork is also high in phosphorus, which can help kind of counterbalance some of the electrolyte issues that I talked about earlier. Okay, now let's jump over and let's talk fats for just a second. I know that the tendency is to get some fats in you to get your calories up, but I urge you to be very, very cautious with the fats. Okay, saturated fats specifically are hard to break down. Monounsaturated fats like olive oil, avocado oil, things like that, they are pretty hard to break down too, but not as bad as saturated fats. Then we have polyunsaturated fats, okay, like fish oil and stuff like that. We wanna to lean towards the polyunsaturated fats for the two day period after you break your fast, okay? So after you break your fast for two days, limit saturated fat and limit monounsaturated fat and opt for more polyunsaturated fats or just go low fat altogether. The reason behind this is simple. Your digestive enzymes, digestive processes slow down when you're fasting. Why would they speed up? It makes no sense, right? You're not consuming food. So that means it takes time to rebuild those. Well, we don't break down fats very well without digestive enzymes like lipase and things like that. Another thing that you can add to the mix would be MCT oil or MCT powder. Okay, the reason I say this is because it avoids typical digestion. MCTs are absorbed via passive diffusion. They don't break down the same way as regular fats. So if you're concerned about not getting enough fat in and you just need to get the calories up, I would advise maybe trying some MCT. Again, this is for information purposes only. I'm not a doctor. I'm not advising you to do anything specifically uh, as far as medical advice goes, but the MCTs will at least allow you to get some fats in, and if you're doing ketosis and you wanna be able to try to generate more ketones, that might not be a bad way to go. Uh, I've linked down below to a company called HVMN, which in my opinion has some of the best tasting MCT powder out there, so you can add it to coffee, you can add it to whatever. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you check them out. They're a supporter and a sponsor of this channel, so a huge thank you to you guys over at HVMN, but also just special access, special pricing for anyone that watches my channel and is a supporter of this channel. Um, as far as utilizing the MCT, small amounts over the course of a couple days. And by all means, you don't have to use it. I'm not trying to force it on anybody. I'm just saying if you're trying to increase calories, trying to increase ketone production a little bit more, it's probably the best option, in my opinion, for uh, a fat that's not gonna require a lot of digestion. So anyway, special link down below. But let's move into the veggie side of things. Do not, by all means, consume raw veggies in the first 24 hours after breaking a long-term fast. I know the tendency is to get the greens in and get your health stuff going on, but trust me, the breakdown is just not gonna work out very well in your gut. You also want to avoid foods that are high in oxalates in general. Okay, so for two days after your fast, no spinach, no Swiss chard. You could do a quick Google search, I'll save you the time so I'm not listing them off. Foods that are high in oxalates and just avoid those for two days. Your best option with veggies is after that 24 hour period, having boiled steamed veggies that are easier to break down. I'll make this easy for you in the world of nuts. Try to avoid almonds, try to avoid pistachios, try to avoid cashews. Quite frankly, the only nut I would really recommend you have in that first couple of day period after a longer term fast is going to be probably macadamia nuts because they're easier fat to break down in terms of just the whole world of things, but they also don't have the phytates. But realistically, probably just avoid them. Okay, this next piece comes back to the carbohydrates and back to the salt for a second. Okay, I have to touch on why this is a problem when you combine them. Carbohydrates are going to spike insulin, which is going to allow sodium into the cell. But the more carbohydrates that we consume, the more that the cell is going to hold on to sodium and water. 
After a fast, because of this whole osmolarity law thing, you might find that if you go overboard on sodium a little much, you end up retaining a bunch of water. Okay, you end up suffering from some edema. If you end up having edema, well, at its very core, you feel inflamed, you feel bloated. This changes some things in how the body operates. So just avoid the salt and avoid the carbohydrates uh, in combination whenever you can. I hate to break it to you, but the couple of days after a longer term fast are not exactly the most fun. Now, full disclaimer again, a 36 hour fast is not that long term of a fast, but for people that aren't adjusted to it, it is. So if you're doing frequent 36 hour fasts, these rules might not apply to you. But if you're doing like longer 72, 96 hour fast, these rules will definitely apply. Just want to put it out there that you don't need to be following this protocol after every single 36 hour fast. And one of the biggest things that we need to focus on too is again, for that two day period, avoid grains, avoid gluten, and avoid casein protein. So a little bit of whey protein would be okay, but I don't want the casein protein because again, how damaging it can potentially be to the gut mucosal layer. It's standard practice for the body to reduce uh, some of the collagen in the gut mucosal layer during a fast. It's just part of the process. So again, that's why we eat small meals, it's why we don't do things that disrupt that gut, uh, that gut layer, right? Well, it's been demonstrated in studies that when you look at gluten, when you look at grains and things like that, it can be disruptive to that gut membrane, that mucosal layer. It can be sensitive and can trigger the release of what are called lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. This can result in chronic inflammation later on down the line because you have lipopolysaccharides, basically you have bacteria or components of bacteria from the gut that shouldn't be in the bloodstream floating around in the bloodstream. This causes an immune response, which in turn makes you inflamed. So I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much, but the point is keeping it simple. Okay. So we want things like boiled broccoli. We want things like, or steamed broccoli. We want lean chicken. We want lean turkey. We want lean fish. We want lean pork. We want minimal, if no grains, I'd be okay with a little bit of sweet potato, a little bit of regular potato. It's going to be bland. It's going to be like a diet. You would give a sick dog for a couple of days, but the reality is that's how you're going to build yourself back and not have a weird rebound. Again, it's not for every single time you fast, it's just for the longer term fast. So as always, please keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you in the next video.